Let's do it. Greetings. Thanks to everyone for coming out to our group author reading. This reading is brought to you by Strong Woman, Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and under underrepresented gender identity authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly virtual book read sessions. You can find out more about Strong Women, Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided in the chat and by visiting our website, a link to which will be added to the chat. I'm your host today, Sarah Smith, and you can find out more about me in the provided handout as well. Today we'll be featuring six authors, Diane Sampson, Maria de Blasi, Samantha Bryant, Danny Hoots, K.B. Morris, and Karen Luwachi. Each author will have eight minutes to read. A couple of quick notes. We'll be pasting a link to a Google survey in the chat. Please fill it out to let us know what you thought of the reading to be added to our mailing list, which will be the best way to find out about future readings and to possibly win some free books and swag. This is only for the live reading, so if you're watching this afterwards, sign up for our live readings later. Here we go. Our first reader is Diane Sampson. Diane E. Sampson is the author of Gems of Fire, Valley of Bones, and Mountain of Flame. Her love of words led her to earn a degree in magazine journalism, and she has worked as a reporter, editor, and in public relations. She will never be without a golden retriever. Diane, take it away. All right, thank you, Sarah. Hi, I'm Diane Sampson again, and today I am reading an abridged excerpt from my very first book in the young adult fantasy series, Gems of Fire. So here, Anna has been sold as a slave, and she finds herself in kind of a pickle, hiding in a cabinet and trying not to be discovered. So here it goes. Anna's head whirled as Anwar's voice transformed into a dull, slow chant. She tried to block out the voice knocking at the edge of her mind, louder and louder. She couldn't stop it. It wanted to shred her, rip her, kill her. She closed her eyes but couldn't rid her mind of the thing with the terrible red eyes and claws ready to tear her apart. She was fighting and losing. She slipped to the cabinet's floor. Desperate, she thought of home, the priest, her mother, anything but here, rolling hills of green, cool swift streams, horses' hooves throwing sod in their thundering wake. She felt farly under her again, galloping hard and eating up ground with huge strides. She saw the lamp. The voices slowed in her head, but Anwar's voice was still chanting. A new voice sounded. In two moons, the scene will be set. A full moon will light the way. The city of white rock will fall, and the dead will be your prey. Anna focused on the riddle. The claws pricked her mind. She almost cried out in pain. The crimson eyes bored holes through her, and at once she stood in front of the evil presence, fully exposed. Claws reached for her throat, and Anna screamed in her mind, no, leave me. She clamped her eyes shut and pulled her hair so the pain would block out the horrible voice. The claws lessened their grip. A new voice, soft and sweet, filled the air. The grip loosened as if its owner listened as well. A bit of caution we give you now. A prisoner will run free. If the truth is told in time, your defeat is sure to be. The pressure was back twice as hard like long fingers of steel cinching Anna's throat. She gasped and clawed for air. I'm going to die. She pictured the chapel and the light on the altar. It flickered in the back of her mind, small and unattended. She focused on that light, drawing it toward her. The blackness increased its grip and desperation. Again, those deep red eyes bored into hers. No, leave me alone, Anna screamed in her head again. She called to the chapel's light and fire pulsed through her. The pressure in her neck released and she sucked great gulps of air into her lungs. With a jolt, she fell against the back of the armoire. In the same instant, the fire in the room flashed and went out. She opened her eyes, panting and hoping that no one had heard her. What happened? asked Seamus. Something powerful interrupted our connection. Anwar's voice was weary. 
Can you try again? No, I'm too drained. Hand me a bandage. The spirits feed on the energy in my blood and that in the gems. Anwar paused. We may know enough. At the second moon, the time will be right. What could the spirit have been saying about a prisoner? I wouldn't know, my lord. Do you have more gems? A whole chest full. Hmm, with these gems, I will be able to discern the meaning. If someone stands to thwart us, I will eliminate them. Your gods will help. We have time. How many men follow you? Hundreds will follow me to the death, said Seamus. After all the royal heads are gone, you'll have your way with the armies. Trust me, he chuckled. That stupid king won't know what hit him. Are you then in an agreement that I shall control all the north with you on the throne? But answering to me, the king asked, you will pay your tribute in gems of power. Anna heard Seamus make a kissing noise toward the floor. Disgusting. Worse was the slow panic rising in her heart. Seamus was plotting to overthrow her father. She thought of the man in the tavern. She must find him. She must warn her father. My king, you have the mind and the will of the great rulers of the past. You will be my Lord and be remembered forever for your greatness and glory in this kingdom and all the way to the north, Seema said, groveling. Anna thought she was going to be sick. She was already dizzy from the incense. Then our time is set. Two moons, answered Seema. Two moons, said the king. You won't regret giving me these gems. The spirits will guide us to victory. Now refresh yourself and be on your way. Thank you, my king. Seema left the room. My king. He should hang for those words alone. Anna heard others join the king who apparently ate a meal. He now spoke to his subjects in a language Anna couldn't understand. Would they ever leave? After several hours of sitting in the cramped armor, Anna's eyelids grew heavy. Fatigue took over and she slept. The room was dark and silent when she woke. She rubbed her neck and longed to stretch her legs. Her hand trembled as she pulled the latch on the door, locked. Oh no. She wiggled the handle a little harder, making a quiet clicking noise. No luck. Oh, she had to get out. Calling for help wasn't an option, and there were no loose boards in the back of the cabinet. She shoved the handle harder. Her foot slid on the floor, bumping into the back of the armoire. She banged her shoulder into the door with all of her strength. It swung open with great force. A man grabbed her as she stumbled. Been hiding out, sneaking around, said a cruel voice in her ear. Light a lantern, he called. We have a spy. No, no, I was only locked in and I fell asleep. I didn't know where the sheets went and silence. He struck her nose and Anna recoiled in pain and dizziness. She tasted blood. What is this? Asked a voice Anna shuddered to remember as the king's. He walked into the room. My good king, we found a servant girl locked in the wardrobe. Anna kept her eyes on the floor. And how long have you been there? He waved his hand. It doesn't matter. Kill her. He turned back as he reached the door. Wait, muzzle her instead. Jolly will make good use of her. Lock her in the dungeon until he can be summoned. The king left. Do you know what muzzle means? Asked the burly man, grabbing her by the hair. We cut spies' tongues out so they can't tell what they know. We'll see what Jolly will pay for you. He loves the muzzled girls best, the other man said, snorting. His breath reeked. Anna kicked and screamed, no, I didn't hear anything. Please, no. The man punched her in the stomach and she doubled over in pain, gasping for air. No, someone, please. Anna's chin jerked up and a rough, filthy hand grabbed her tongue. Anna gagged as the other man drew his blade. She squeezed her eyes shut. This was it. Her heart pounded so fast she thought she might collapse. The door burst open and arrow released. The hand lost its grip on her tongue as its owner fell to the floor. An instant later, the other man fell, clutching an arrow, piercing his chest. Anna would have fallen as well if a man hadn't caught her and tossed her over his shoulder. He ran. He tore down the stairs, taking them two at a time. Anna's sore head hit his back at every jolt. He plopped her on the ground and they sprinted to the stables. Finally, they reached his horse. He threw the saddle on and yelled, can you ride? Yes, yes, Anna choked out. She hoped he was the man who had asked for water, but she hardly cared. He mounted and she leapt up easily behind him. The horse charged out the stable door. Duck, he yelled as the door frame zipped over their heads. Men with swords yelled and ran in their direction. An arrow whizzed by Anna's arm. Go, go, she yelled. They're coming. 
So thanks for listening. So that was one scene from Gems of Fire and I'll send it back to Sarah. Um, also, you want to look um, for my giveaway. Thanks so much. Wow, Diane, thank you. Our second reader is Maria de Blasi. Dr. Maria de Blasi is a native New, Ex New Mexican mestiza and award-winning writer and educator living in the land of enchantment. She writes and teaches about everyday magic, ordinary gothic, romance, and all things witchy. She is forever looking for magic in her life and somehow always finding more than she thought was there. Maria, over to you. Thank you uh, for having me here today. So before I read my very short excerpt, uh, I want to give you all a little bit of context about the story. Um, so Weep Woman Weep is based on the legend of La Llorona, which is a spooky urban legend that has haunted many a child in Hispanic and Latinx communities. So in New Mexico, La Llorona, or the Weeping Woman, is said to roam the banks of the Rio Grande in search of the children she lost. So she drowns them in the river in a fit of rage and then spends the rest of her afterlife trying to reclaim them. Of course, she'll gladly take another, another person's child in their place. So I played with the story a bit for my novella, uh, looking at our mixed race heritage of Latinx, indigenous and European ancestry and the history of colonization. And in my story, La Llorona only takes young women in the town of Sueño, New Mexico. Instead of drowning them in the river, she baptizes them and they come back from the water all wrong and end up leading really sorrowful lives. Mercy, the protagonist of my story, loses her best friend Sherry to La Llorona, but somehow survives the encounter with a few side effects. She can't cry, first of all, because her tears do things strange things, magical things, scary things that she can't always control. And she has to be careful around water because La Llorona will do anything to reclaim the one soul who got away. So this short scene I'm reading occurs as around the time Mercy is rebuilding a life for herself. She's lost pretty much everything. And this isn't spoilers, this happens in the first few pages of the story. Her uh, best friend, her mom, her home, and starts figuring out a way to move forward by starting her own farm. Mercy wants the sorrows of the women in her family's blood to end with her. She refuses to pass it on and begins reclaiming a life free from sorrow, even as La Llorona keeps trying to reclaim her. So she's also realizing that part of what La Llorona is attracted to is this generational sadness. So at this point in the story, Mercy is really trying to figure out how to be happy, um, as are we all, right? <laughs> um, so this scene is about one of the times she's experimenting with allowing herself to enjoy nice things. <clears throat> oh, and this is also told in first person. So the person speaking is Mercy. I thought I'd survived. The truth ended up being a little more complicated, though it took me a few years and a lot of heartache to work it all out. I wanted to get La Llorona out of my life, that was for sure, but I couldn't do that until I was strong enough. So I woke up at dawn when her powers waned every morning of every week of every year since the day she marked me and tended my land. The droughts had been getting harder and harder, making stones out of seeds and hard hearts out of too many hopes dashed to bits. But I was determined to see Mercy Farm thrive. I was reborn with the sun and the earth and the seeds in my hand. One time, I was feeling mighty fine and thought I'd try something different. I saw this ad in a magazine where a woman was in, was in an obscenely large bathtub, covered up to the neck in bubbles. This was in a room with a marble floor and there were candles everywhere and she had her hair up all nice and a face mask on. Well. I got to thinking a nice long soak after a hard day's work would be mighty fine. This was a few months after my run-in with Sherry. 
And in this part of the story, she runs into Sherry after Sherry's been baptized in the grocery store. And it's very traumatizing. So she gives her a lot to think about. So, so Mercy goes on to say, I was trying hard to let myself enjoy things more. It occurred to me after seeing Sherry that her fatal flaw was not believing that her future was right in front of her. Or maybe she was too afraid to take it with both hands. I began to wonder if we didn't hold back and do half the work for La Llorona with all that we ran from life. So I bought some bubble baths and made more beeswax candles and set about having myself a spa night. I mean, my bathroom was nowhere near as nice as the one in the picture. My tub was only long enough for me to sit upright in, and it was right next to the toilet, but I may do. It was lovely. I mean, divine. I could see why fancy women like this. I put on the radio and the music was soft and sweet like the candlelight against the fading day. I was so relaxed that I was about to fall asleep in that tub. That was when I felt cold hands grip the soles of my feet and pull me under. I should have seen it coming. Why willingly linger in a body of water? But I didn't, and that's how I found myself drowning in bubbles and thrashing around in my tub. It's also how I learned that that evil woman, La Llorona, could find me anywhere, and I mean anywhere, so I could never let my guard down. Her grip was strong. Seemed like the harder I fought, the stronger she got. I was flailing about, my arms searching for anything and everything to hold on to. When I knocked one of those beeswax candles into the tub, to this day, I have no idea why that scared her, but it did. She recoiled something quick at the hiss of the flame when the wax hit water. I didn't waste a second. I hoisted myself out of the tub and collapsed on the bathroom floor, choking and sputtering and sopping wet. Took me forever to clean up the mess and cough up all those flower scented bubbles. My feet were cold and sore for days with claw marks where her bony fingers hooked into my skin. Whoever said bubble baths were relaxing was a big old liar. That's all for my reading today. If you're interested in any of the giveaways, um, if you're in the US, I'll be giving away signed copies of my first book, uh, Everyday Enchantments. And that is uh, Musings on Orderday, Ordinary Magic and Daily Conjurings. So for anyone who is like Mercy, looking for a little more joy in their everyday life, and if you're outside of the U.S., I have ebook copies of Wait for Me for you. Thank you again. Wow, Maria, thank you. Our third reader is Samantha Bryant. Samantha Bryant wishes she were taller, faster, and braver. So she writes characters who are her menopausal superhero series can be found at http um, uh, colon slash slash Samantha Bryant um, or at your favorite bookseller upon request. Remember, heroism has no age limit. Go for it, Samantha. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm reading from the first book in the Menopausal Superheroes tonight, Going Through the Change. It's now a set of four novels, fourth novel coming out in December, as well as a couple of novellas and some shorts. So the very first character I made for this was a woman named Helen, who was having hot flashes that became a little more literal. So this is a chapter with Helen called Helen Plays with Fire. Uh, the other people mentioned in it are her daughter, Mary. She's living with her daughter, Mary, right now because she accidentally burnt down her apartment. And <laughs> Cindy is the... Um, scientist who may have caused these uh, side effects. So here we go. Helen plays with fire. Helen tossed off the covers. She couldn't sleep. It had only been a few hours since Cindy had dropped her off after yet another all night session testing the limits of her abilities, tipsy on wine and drunk on power. She had stumbled to the bedroom, thrown away her burnt up clothes and flopped into bed. She fell into sleep like a diver into a pool. She hadn't expected to resurface again so soon. She checked the bedside clock, 4.30 a.m., too late to be called night and too early to be called morning. But her eyelids were up and she shook with a restless energy. She knew this feeling. It was excitement. 
The round of experiments with Cindy last night had shown her what she could do, and she wanted to do more. It had been a long time since her limits had been stretched, since the world had seemed new and exciting. God, what a rush. It was like being in love. She sat on the edge of the bed for a moment, then padded to the closet and pulled on a long t-shirt. It had been her husband's and proved more durable than he had. She wondered if it were possible to buy fireproof clothing. Moving quietly through the apartment, she made her way to the patio, uh, to the kitchen and to the patio doors at the back. She stepped through into the patch of grass that sufficed as a yard for Mary's barbecue party a week or so ago. Helen looked around. The windows of the two apartments above Mary's overlooked the yard, but they were dark. The back of the yard was bordered by some kind of industrial strength hedges, probably to protect the homeowners behind from having to see the seedy little apartment dwellers smoking their cigarettes and drinking their beer. Helen willed a ball of fire into her hand and made it roll. She tossed it from one hand to the other, rolling it across her arms and laughing. She balanced it on one finger like Wilt Chamberlain and made it spin, first one direction and then another. She made a second and a third ball and tried to juggle them. Whenever she dropped one in the grass, she stomped out the small fire with her bare foot and made a replacement. When she tired of fire juggling, she decided to try other shapes. She made a sort of spear, a long, thin flame. She bent, around it, bent it around itself until it was a ring. She spun it in the air and then around one wrist like it was a hula hoop. She thought about spinning it around her waist, but knew the shirt would never survive it. She didn't want to end up naked in her daughter's backyard. God, this was fun. She hadn't had this kind of fun in years. She lined up a couple of beer cans and soda bottles in various parts of the yard, and making her finger into a gun, shot them with small blasts of fire, leaving smoking piles of melted tin can and broken glass. She was trying to decide what to do next when she froze, stopped by a small squeak. The sliding door squeaked in its track. Helen turned, just in time to see her wide-eyed daughter poking her head out the small opening she had made. Her voice sounded almost childlike, like she was afraid. Mom? It was a truth of life that as a woman aged, Helen thought, people tended to treat her more and more like a child. Sales clerks called older women honey, just like they might a child. Senior food and movie tickets were sold at a reduced price, just like a child's. Discounts and nicknames weren't so bad in the scheme of things, but the assumption of incompetence was hard to take. Helen wasn't sure when she crossed that line, the magic age that made people treat her like she was old, but she had. It was especially hard to take from Mary. Even when her daughter's advice was good, it still galled Helen to take it. After all, she was the one with life experience here. Her daughter ought to be listening to her wisdom. But as Helen had gotten older, she had often thought the roles were reversing between herself and her daughter. It was Mary who was always trying to tell her how to live her life instead of the other way around. It was Mary who wanted to know where she was and what she was up to, like it was her job to keep tabs on her mother. It was Mary who Helen had to explain herself to. Sometimes... It was annoying. This morning, though, it was different. Now Mary, in the role of mother, was watching as she, in the role of child, said again and again, look what I can do. And she could do amazing things. She demonstrated again all the forms she could make the fire take. She showed her the way she was impervious to harm from fire or smoke, clapping out flames in her hands and stomping them out with her bare feet. Mary's face showed a complicated combination of emotions from fear to excitement and back around with a little bit of worry and disbelief mixed in. How is this happening? How can this even be possible? Mary asked. Helen considered. Should she tell her daughter about Dr. Lou and the pills? She looked at her daughter. Mary was an open-minded person in a lot of ways, but she was also very sure of what was right and wrong. But still, if she didn't tell Mary... Who was she going to tell? It was so all so amazing and exciting. Truthfully, she was dying to tell. So, you remember those pills you got for me? So that's the end of that chapter. And um, for my giveaway, I'm giving away digital copies of the first book in the series in hopes that you will love it and come back and buy all the other ones.
So thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha. Our uh, inner pyromaniac is, is loving this. <laughs> Our fourth reader is Danny Hoots. Danny Hoots is a young adult, science fiction and fantasy author, and likes to be inspired by ancient tales. She enjoys reading her history, astronomy, and plants. And in her spare time, she's watching anime, reading manga, or drawing. Take it away, Daddy. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I also wanted to note I have a autoimmune disorder, so it affects my dryness in my mouth. So if I uh, cough a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'll be reading the scene from my first chapter, um, and it's in the point of view of Ellie, who is a 19-year-old bounty hunter. So begin. It didn't used to be this way. I tapped my smoke on the ashtray, exhaling the herb-filled vapor. It was a delightful blend of local plants and made an order at the bar. This establishment seemed to have it all. Smokes, drinks, both alcoholic and not. Games, food, gambling, it was all here, meaning everyone in town occupied this small bar at all hours of the day. Thank goodness all I could smell was my herbal smoke and the alcohol in my friend Zach's breath. I had a feeling the room smelt of sweat and wet fur. How many girly martinis are you going to drink tonight? I raised an eyebrow and flashed him a grin. Zach stared at me, his shimmering gold eyes unamused as he downed the rest of the fruity martini through his tiny straw. Why he always used them instead of drinking on the side of the glass, I did not understand. Perhaps it was so he'd feel he was pacing himself, even if we both knew that was a lie. Setting the glass down, Zach pulled loose strands of red hair back into his butt. I'll have you know... These drinks taste a lot better than the straight alcohol you always have. I sighed. It's not straight alcohol. It's called whiskey. Tastes nasty is what it is. I smiled a little. Anyway, I should cut you off there. That's your third one and our contact isn't even here yet. There isn't much alcohol in these. At least I taste none. Yeah, I've noticed you don't. But that doesn't mean there isn't any in it. We've gone over this. You're a year older than me and should, have, should know better. He let out a breath of defeat. Oh, yeah, a whole whopping year. Like, age matters between 19 and 20. But fine, I won't have another until the guy gets here. What's he look like again? He's a human, and honestly, I'm not sure we can trust him. But he's the only lead we've got so far. Glancing out the crowded area, I noted all the beings that were having a good time. On the planet, there are, there are a total of five different races, six if one counted the Pleiadians. There were the Lyrians, who appeared as a mix of human and wild cat. I spotted at least a dozen different groups that had Lyrians, and our bartender was one as well. That made sense, since we were in the Lyrian zone. Then there were the Syrians. There weren't too many of those here, merfolk who could change between fish-like and human in a matter of seconds. Typically, the Lyrians and Syrians didn't get along, just like cats and fish, but don't say that to their face. They don't appreciate it. Then there are the Solarians, who were lizard-like and cold-blooded, both physically and emotionally. There were a few here as well, and I did my best not to make eye contact with any of them. Then, of course, there are the humans, which was what my kind appeared like as well, at least for the most part. I glanced around and found quite a few, as humans like to travel and settle among the different zones, and they create half-species or half-humans. Typically humans, typical humans not sticking with their own kind. I sighed as I glanced around more, some more, seeing if I could spot my own race, as if that were going to happen. This was the new norm, I suppose. There weren't many of us Calcians left, shapeshifters who almost all had been destroyed in the attack three years ago. The other races didn't like us, as we could turn into any species we wanted. The only way to tell we were Calcian was with our shimmering gold eyes. Each zone had propaganda against our race, making it illegal for us to shift, and eventually we were attacked. The problem was, our zone was heavily armored and shielded. Someone had to been given them the codes and told them how to get in. I fiddled with, with the wooden ring that hung around my neck, and that person was my ex, Cornelius Adams. Zach brought me back to the present. Not too many humans in these parts, though, so he might know something. Surprised he didn't want to meet us in the quarter. 
I nodded and was about to agree when I heard a crackly voice next to me. Well, well, what do we have here? I turned to find three Salarian men. They wore dark, scaly leather made of the large lizard creatures they called dracons that they used for either meat, clothing, or road instead of horses. Horses didn't, like, hold up their weight. Only the Salarians could tame them, which I had a feeling had to do with the fact that they appeared similar. The larger of the three Salarians was the one who talked. He was more than likely their leader, since they always went by who was the largest. His eyes were almost at the side of his head like a snake I wanted to shoot before it bit me. But in this crowd, I couldn't do that. I gripped my cum gun, but kept it in my holster. We aren't doing anything wrong, just enjoying some drinks. Go make trouble elsewhere. I turned and tried to ignore them. One civilian grabbed my shoulder and turned my, me back around. I wonder if there would be a day where I could go to the bar without being harassed. That prospect was looking bleak. Don't you dare ignore me, you calcium scum. His tongue slithered in his mouth, leaving me disgusted. There was nothing pretty about Salarians. Salarians. Why couldn't I ever get yelled at by something handsome? Zach stood up. Hey, leave her alone. Oh, don't worry. I was going... I wasn't going to forget about you. He nodded to the other two to go stand near Zach. Glanced around, I noticed that my most eyes were on us now, and it didn't look like anyone was going to help. Typical. No one wanted to get involved if there were Salarians. We have a client waiting for us, so unless you have business, meaning you will pay for our bounty hunting services, I flashed my gun. There isn't. Then it's best that you leave us alone. Are you threatening me? I'm only marrying... Whatever your ten is, kind sir. The Salarian hissed, glancing around me as if looking for some kind of weakness. If you ever ran into the few Calcians that were left, my gut told me that they usually backed down or groveled at his feet by now. I, however, was not one to grovel. I could see his long, clawed hands reaching for his belt, more than likely where he stored a weapon. Without a second thought, I pulled out my gun and shot him straight in the chest. I heard his two friends let out a screeching hiss, pivoting. I shot the other two, and then all hell broke loose. So that is a section of my first chapter, and I'll be giving away a arc as this book isn't going to be out till November for whoever wins the contest. So check that out. Why, thank you. Thank you. Our fifth reader is KB Morris coming to us. From England. KB Morris is a playwright and writer of mail and short fiction as well as articles. She has had both articles and short stories published in various magazines and has taken her play to the Camden Fringe. She is currently writing a, a trilogy of, <laughs> excuse me, noir detective novellas. Yeah. And completing a collection of 10 dark short stories. Am I right that you're coming from, uh, to us from England? KB? Sorry? Uh, am I right what? you're coming to us from England? Yeah, I'm in London. Oh. So <laughs> you're, you're being nice enough to read for us at Dark O'Clock. Thank you I so am, yeah. much. Take it away. Rover added whiskey to his morning coffee and lit his first cigarette of the day. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Right. You're good. He was sitting outside the cafe on the corner of Holland Garter and Schweigart's Gate on a blustering autumn morning. He brushed ash from his shirt and took out his notebook and held it down with a glass ashtray. He spent the previous day in Oslo Public Library researching the Black Circle, which was a group of black metal musicians who hung out at the record shop. According to his research, the Black Circle were feminine anti-Christian Satanists, responsible for burning down at least eight churches in the early 90s. Misanthropes obsessed the idea of evil and neo vargan nationalist mysticism. They openly admitted to torturing animals, child abuse and murder. At the centre of this group was Oyston Ariseth, or Euronymous, founder of the band Mayhem. Their lead singer, Per Dead Olhim, killed cats and hacked at himself on stage with a sacrificial knife. It was believed that he suffered from a rare condition called Cotard delusion or walking corpse delusion. The victim thinks their body is actually dead and they are putrefying. He, unsurprisingly, killed himself. 
Helvet stemmed from the Norse Hell's Viti or Hell's Punishment, was a record shot founded by Euronymous in 1991. It was a base for his label, Death Like Silence Productions, and acted as a hub for the Black Circle who used to meet in the basement and, according to some accounts, perform satanic rituals. The shop was closed in 93, a few months before Euronymous's brutal murder by a former friend. Rover looked up from his notes at the neat red and white buildings in front of him and the quiet pavements of modern Oslo. A child skateboarded past and he wondered at what had driven middle-class kids from nice neighbourhoods towards such nihilism and darkness. He removed his sunglasses and rubbed his eyes. Rover swallowed back the last of his coffee, stuffed, stuffed his notebook into his pocket and gestured for the bill. He stood and lit a cigarette that he puffed as he walked towards Helvet. Schweigard's Gate was a pleasant street with cherry blossom trees and four-storied white buildings. Though it was windy, the sky was blue, the trees shielded him from the bright sun. He stood beside the bus stop and gazed across the road at the now infamous shop, which had lain empty since the murder trial. Set in a large, re large residential building, it looked benign, differentiated from its neighbours only by the graffiti painted across the walls. Rover crossed the road, glanced around for onlookers, then easily unpicked the large padlock and slipped inside. He turned on his torch, lighting up the dusty black and white check floor. He went over to the counter at the back of the shop. There was nothing there, just empty shelves. He spied the entrance to the basement and went down the worn stone steps. He walked through a room with pipes across the ceiling and a fuse box. It was cold and the air was... It contained nothing but a pile of empty cardboard boxes. He looked through them, but there was nothing of note, just crumpled packing paper. He passed through into another room, even colder than the last, which had a stone bench attached to the wall. Black metal, with an inverted cross for the T, was roughly scrawled on the wall in black spray paint. In front of it was a large iron throne, and on either side of that were tall candlesticks in the shape of pentagrams. Rover felt along the walls for hidden doors or hollow spaces that may contain anything of interest, but there was nothing there. As he ran the torch over the large slabs, he picked out what could have been a pentagram and splashes of black wax. He was just crouching down to examine it more closely when a hand thudded on his shoulder, knocking him to one side. He was yanked to his feet by a very large man wearing sunglasses in the gloom. He must have walked like a cat because Rover hadn't heard a sound. Come with me. Rover was gripped by the arm, held up the stairs and out of the shop. Feet barely touching the ground, he was escorted down the road to a black car with the engine running. As they drew close, the door swung open. Get in, the man growled as he pushed him in. He followed close behind and Rover found himself wedged, wedged in, unable to move. It was dark due to blackout windows and the car smelled the leather and pine freshener. The man was chewing gum and making popping noises. Rover gritted his teeth. They turned right and passed the cafe he'd been in earlier. The radio was on low in the background and the luxury seats were heated. A conversation in Norwegian ensued and as they left Oslo, Rover drifted off. When he awoke, they were driving through heavy snow on a, on a narrow mountain road. To his right were pine trees weighed under a thick layer of snow. The car was quiet now, except for the radio in the background. Large flakes drifted past the window in the twilight, and he wondered how long he'd been asleep. It was nearly dark when they drove through, down a rough path in what looked like a field and pulled up outside a white wooden house. The man yawned and climbed out of the car. He held the door open. Get out. Stiff with a spitting headache, Rover clambered out of the car and stood ankle deep in snow. The men came up either side of him and was escorted up the steps to the front door. One of them pushed it open and ushered him inside. The men went into another room down the hall and closed the door. Mr Latchenden, please come in. A tall man with long dark hair and a beard stood in the doorway to his left. Rover followed him into a spacious room with an open fire. Take a seat, the man waved an arm. Drink? He poured out two large glasses from a stoppered bottle and handed one to Rover, who was sitting in a burgundy leather chair beside the fire. Rover took a sip. It tasted like homemade vodka. He threw back half and cradled the glass while the man settled into the seat opposite. It was silent for a few moments except the crackle of the fire. The man was observing him under his long, dark lashes. He had an air of introspection as though he was used to silence. His thin lips were set in what seemed to be a permanent half-smile as he swallowed his glass. Rover jumped, sending his glass flying as he heard a familiar growl in his ear. The man laughed, delighted at his reaction. He waved his hand and the dog padded to his side and sat beside him. You've already met Skull. He stroked the dog's head. But you got away, it seems. 
He gave one of his half smiles, his eyes glittering in the fire, firelight. Skull like sheep. Are you a sheep, Mr. Latchenden? What? Rover writes his glass on the wooden floor. A sheep. You know what a sheep is, don't you? He leaned forward. Bah! He flashed jagged grey teeth that looked too small for his mouth. Of course I know what a sheep is, Mr. I have many names, but you can call me Knock. He made a double clicking sound with his tongue and laughed. He stood up. Let me get you another. Rover held out his glass and Nock took it with long, delicate fingers. He went over to the sideboard and refilled the glass while Skull kept guard over his charge. I'm wondering why I'm here, Rover said. The end. Hello? Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> I thought my sound had gone. <laughs> no, no, you're you're here and thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to stop recording now. And for those of you who are looking at this later, our final reader is going to be Karen Wachu. You won't get a chance to hear her. That um, you should go and check her work out at karenwachu.com. 